Hello. I am assuming that I am live on Facebook. It's never 100% sure that this is working. I'm sure I'll get some feedback. Somebody will call me soon saying that you don't hear me or see me. So assuming I don't get that, I am live with you on Facebook. Welcome everybody to my AMA. This is week eight. Today is May 7th, I think, as always. Oh, May 7th it is. 2020. I usually keep time by the AMAs. Eight eight weeks in, AMA number eight. And uh, but I'm having so much fun with these AMAs that I think that eventually, when Corona ends, and I'm uh, hopeful that it will at some point, looks like things in certain places like Poland are starting to go in the right direction. Then I will continue. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Jeffrey. Good morning, Richard. Lori and Jeffrey in California. Richard. Parts unknown, somewhere in the Northeast. Good to see everybody out there in Facebook land. Uh, what's been going on? Oh, plenty. Let's see, in terms of, importantly, what, what I've been watching, Last Dance. So the Michael Jordan documentary, of course, huge Jordan fan, uh, watching the document. Phenomenal behind the scenes access to Michael Jordan. Uh, I think that lately, as much as Le LeBron James's career has been long and he had really no drop off in terms of the quality of his play in like 15 years, or I guess he's been in the league, something 15, 16 years. But I gotta say watching Jordan, watching the last, last dance really reminds me that Jordan is the goat, man. Jordan is absolutely the greatest that I've ever seen. I can't talk about Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain, people really back in the day, but Michael Jordan, without question, the best that I've ever seen. And uh, The Last Dance is a pretty interesting behind the scenes look at everything. You get locker room footage and people talking pretty openly, including Michael Jordan, who's not really an oversharer. He's not there on, you know, tweeting and putting all his stuff on Instagram. So to get a little behind the scenes action of Michael Jordan is something very, very special. So I've been doing that. Weather has been okay. Um, Poland is starting to open up. So we can talk a little bit about the situation, what Poland looks like uh, today. We'll get to some questions, have a special guest today, Rabbi David Seth Kirshner. He's gonna come up in a few minutes uh, from New Jersey. He'll talk to us about what life's going on and what life is like in his community. So in Poland, again, a country of 38 million, we should rem remember, 14,740 infected, 733 dead, 4,862 recovered. There hasn't been massive testing. So um, we're, we know, of course, that the number of uh, people with corona, with COVID-19 are much higher, but the, the death toll, 733, still it's a lot of people, but relatively low to what we're seeing in, uh, in a lot of other places. Uh, so maybe take a moment and just reflect on this tragedy we're in and the people that I, I know all of us know people that are affected, that have had people pass away and were you know, it's tragic and hopefully we'll pull through this. So, but Poland is starting to come out of this. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Good morning, Presidente Warner. Jeffrey Rolat says 23 hours to kill. Started watching it last night. I got to tell you, for, to me, Seinfeld's brilliance, the br which is a 23 hours to kill, the new Seinfeld special on Netflix. Uh, huge Seinfeld guy, favorite comedy ever. Uh, can watch the shows over and over and over and know all of them by heart pretty much. But his stand up to me, it's good. I don't say I dislike it, but I can't say that it's complete genius stand up um, in terms of the level of stuff. So he's, I, I'm enjoying it, but you know, it's sort of, I don't know, it's very 90s. So it's always good to see him, but I don't know that that's, uh, I don't know that that's been my favorite uh, stand up. I, to me, there's one stand-up comedian today that is just head and shoulders above everyone else. I, I don't even see him as a stand-up comedian. I just see him as just an absolute brilliant, genius social commentator, and that's Dave Chappelle. So if any of you watch Dave Chappelle, he just puts it all out there, and his take on the world is absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, something special to see. Good morning, Marcel Zielinski, our hero. Hero of the day and every day, ride for the living guru, Marcel Zielinski, reporting in from Montreal. Good morning, Marcel and Marilla. 
So I was talking about Poland, where we are in terms of an update in terms of Poland, uh, that things have started. I mentioned last week, things starting to open up. That is the case. Uh, so we were supposed to actually have presidential elections on Sunday. They've been postponed. They only decided about postponing them really today, which gives you a, it's a very strange thing that we, it was almost like having elections three days from now and nobody was really sure about that. But uh, elections postponed uh, indefinitely. It looks like it'll be some point during the summer, uh, which makes a little bit more sense than having them three days from now when none of us can really move around. Um, the government has said starting May 4th, May 6th, different things able to open, cultural institutions are able to open, but not many really opening because they need to consult with the Department of Health, which is not necessarily forthcoming with all the regulations. So we have a, we're in a weird limbo state where things can open, but aren't necessarily opening. We are also focusing on opening our preschool, which will be the first part of the JCC that can open. So we're busy disinfecting the whole building, we're working very hard, scrubbing the preschool, trying to understand in terms of spacing where the kids can be, how many kids, with all of them at once, not all of them at once. You need to have reserved teachers, which means if a teacher, if you can't have all the teachers at once, because if one gets sick, the assumption is that they all get sick. So you have to have like half the teachers at home at any given point. So uh, very, very complicated. We're trying to figure out what that means. Hotels can start welcoming guests, but restaurants, gyms, swimming pools in the hotels are closed. So very, very mixed. Shopping malls are open from May 4th. Uh, I haven't been to the mall. I haven't seen what it's like. I'm pretty curious what that what that looks like. But uh, theoretically, malls are starting to open. Um, supposedly, that's we're in stage two. Supposedly, stage three is supposed to be within two weeks of stage two, and we're in the second, starting the second week of stage two. Stage three will be further restrictions uh, lifted. So, to me, it's very positive that we're starting to lift these restrictions. I would only say the, that the government was more eager to announce the lifting of restrictions and not necessarily giving us full guidance in terms of what lifting the restrictions means, kind of leaving people a little bit and institutions a little bit on their own. I know Kasha today went to the city hall. She had to pick up some documents and it was open and people are just waiting outside. So things are starting slowly, slowly after after almost two full months of being, I would say, just about completely closed, things really starting to open up, which is nice uh, in Poland, as long as we are able to do it safely. Now, the scary aspect of this is that the government, the Minister of Health said that we close things early, but we haven't yet hit our peak, and our peak is supposed to be this summer or in the fall. So my question would be, if we're only going to peak later on, then why are we opening everything now? Uh, other countries that are opening things up feel like they're already hit their peak, um, So like Israel. So it's a little worry, worrisome for me. I generally uh, feeling that my, my general feeling is that I look and see what Israel does. If is, whatever Israel does is uh, the thing that makes sense for me. I think Israel is generally a good country in terms of understanding that while there is a political aspect to what they do, that it's such a small country and they're used to different crises, whether it's war or just the constant threat of war, that they don't mess around too much with public safety and public health. So I, I always, it's like when you look at uh, flying with liquids. Um, those of us who fly around a lot and fly to Israel, you understand uh, that in Israel, you can fly in and out of the country with without get without this 100 milliliter or four ounce, I think it is in American measures, uh, liquid limits that you can't bring liquids in, you can't bring a, you know, a half liter bottle of water or something into uh, in and out of countries when you fly. But in Israel, you can through Ben Gurion. So to me, it's always like if Israel is allowing you to do it, to do it, then the other countries probably don't have their don't have their stuff together. And Israel is doing it the Israel is doing it the right way. So uh, I probably probably look at it the same way in terms of this. So just get to a few of your questions. As always, of course, good morning, Sandy. Sandy Leibowitz, how are you doing, Sandy, in New Jersey? Uh, if you have questions, if you want a shout out, just let me know that you're there. If you have any questions, post your questions. Oh, Shari Gersten, 
Good morning, Shari, also in New Jersey. How are you, Shari Gersten? Uh, so I get to some questions that you guys had, and then we're going to get to our special, special guest, Rabbi David Seth Kirshner from Temple, Temple Emmanuel in Kloster, New Jersey. Is JCC Krakow opening soon? So I did uh, get to that. We are in the process of preparing to open. The preschool will be the first stage. We really are four separate elements of the JCC. If you look at us as an institution, we're a preschool, we're a senior center, we're an office, and then we're a cultural institution. So those four pieces of what we're doing here are gonna open in all different, uh, all different times. And the first will be the preschool and very, very sadly, but understandably, I think the last to open is gonna be our senior center, which is, uh, I really miss the seniors, our survivors heart and soul of our community. We're staying in touch with them, as I mentioned, but we're not gonna, not gonna be able to open the senior club yet. First question that you guys uh, sent in. Good morning, Adam Lupkin, Adam in Miami. Miss you too, Adam. So I did a talk with directors of JCC Warsaw and JCC Budapest. Do our institution, institutions cooperate somehow? Yes, we do. We share best practices. We are in constant contact. We do some cross-programming, especially obvious connection, JCC Krakow and JCC Warsaw. We speak the same language. We're in the same country. Um, so we, uh, that, that makes sense. But we also do a lot with, uh, we, we are hopefully going to do, do more and more with JCC Budapest. Um, Rabbi Michael Paley, who's very involved with all three institutions and has moved from New York City uh, from uh, being a rabbi and residence at UJA to help set up um, a program for a Tarbut program, it's called, to, to develop lay leadership in Central Europe. So he's very involved with all of our institutions. He's on our board, uh, Friends of Board, and he is kind of shepherding uh, this relationship as we move forward. And he has helped me understand how important it is for us to be able to connect these three institutions that have so much in common and that are serving uh, similar, similar constituencies here. So next question, if I was a rabbi like my dad wanted, what denomination would I have most probably chosen? That's a tough one. Not really believing so much in the kind of whole God thing makes it a little, uh, a little more difficult to enter, maybe a little easier in some sense in terms of choosing a denomination. I think we can say that Orthodox is, is, uh, is out in that one. I, I personally believe I wouldn't be able to participate in something that women aren't equal equal partners in, and uh, I, I so that kind of rules out Orthodox. I grew up oh, sort of leaving my Orthodox world and, and participating in conservative uh, Jewish life, which is something very comfortable for me. So that would be an option. Uh, rabbi Tyson Herberger, who used to be a rabbi here in, in Poland, now he's back in Norway. He always told me that I should go be a secular humanist rabbi, since I don't really need to believe in in anything, and I would be. Very good, uh, very good in that role with my somewhat atheistic uh, beliefs. So we'll have to see. I don't know. There's still time to be a rabbi. Uh, so, but as of now, I, I don't, I don't think that's in the cards. Next question. Now that Poland is opening, is my sign collection growth going to be affected? Uh, yes. Closed Poland. There are plenty of signs lying around. It's been a little bit easier for me to collect my uh, my signs. I usually hold a few up, but there are none really nearby. I've been very busy, but uh, as Poland opens up, I'll have to slow down with my uh, sign collecting. Uh, who, let's see, Benji Lovett. Benji, a little bit late, number one, our Kathy Bates, number one fan, Benji Lovett. JCC t-shirt giveaways. No, Benji Lovett. Uh, there's a rumor that Benji Lovett is going to uh, the very famous comedian, Israeli comedian, expat American, now Israeli comedian, Benji Lovett is going to, loves JCC, -shirt, JCC t shirts so much that he's going to perform only exclusively in JCC t shirts. We're in delicate negotiations with Benji about that. See if we can make that happen. Any updates on Ride for the Living? We are pushing hard with virtual Ride for the Living. So no bar for entry. Anybody can walk somewhere or, or run somewhere or get on a bike around their house or in their stationary bike at home and uh, do virtual Ride for the Living with us. Uh, looks like Ride for the Living in its regular sense is not going to happen this year or it'll be much, much smaller, but we're really looking for everybody to be in, uh, to join us on virtual Ride for the Living, uh, to be able to support the JCC, get in shape, and let's, of course, remember the message of Ride for the Living, Jewish life, Overall, and especially Jewish life in Poland did not end with the Holocaust. Uh, 
Will Poland be as one more question and then I'm going to get to our guest. Will Poland be a safe place to travel after borders are open? Uh, yeah, I guess that uh, Poland will be as safe as anywhere else. Poland has done a good job, as I, I've talked about every week, dealing with the corona epidemic. Poland is overall, in terms of crime or anything, a safe place, so you don't have to worry about that. And hopefully we will uh, get the borders open at some point, I'm guessing during the summer, and people can come visit. So I am going to now introduce my guest. Uh, he's a great friend of this institution, a good friend of mine. He is a rabbi uh, at uh, Temple Emmanuel in Kloster, New Jersey, uh, past president of the New York Board of Rabbis, the immediate past president of the New Jersey Board of Rabbis. Um, just an incredible, incredible, huge, long CV here. I'm not gonna read everything. He's been the rabbi at Temple, Temple Emmanuel since 2007. And I am going to now introduce Rabbi David Seth Kirshner, our good friend. Who I... Jen Dobre. Oh, there he is, Jen Dobre. Good to see Vod you, Rabbi. How are Good you? Good to see you. Vodan Shedem Jeshem Prasha. Aha, there we go. Rabbi Kirshner, an, Poland, yeah. an, old, an old Poland hand. So first yeah. of all, I have to say, because David Seth, you get the hyphenated first name going. Not everybody always sees that. People generally call you David, David Seth, Rabbi Kirshner, DSK. Any of those work, sir. I always always respond well to the word sir. sir. Um, so any of those work just fine. Sir, Chili D. Chili D, that's a good one. I like that one. And where, so, so, so Rabbi Kirshner, Sir, where, where are you? Where are you calling it from? From home? I'm in my house, which has um, I'm in my dining room. I don't know how much you can see. I've turned my dining room into a little office space here. Um, and this has basically been my working office for the last uh, 10 weeks. Our, um, my wife and I were in Morocco in February for 10 days came home on Thursday and on Saturday night, we went to Washington for APAC, came back from APAC and basically have been quarantined since. Um, my kids have been uh, off school since that time. Well, let me rephrase that. They haven't been in their school building. They've been in school learning online since that time. We had synagogue services a couple of times, but they were awkward. Um, so we had Purim services. We had um, Shabbat B'nai Mitzvah, a couple of you know small services, but we haven't had major services since that time. And we've been making an office here. My, my kids have made an office in their room for school, my wife downstairs and me here. So um, yeah, that's what we've been doing. Gotcha. So yeah, New Jersey's been, New Jersey's been hit very hard. Uh, we've been hit, and our synagogue's been hit very hard. Um, I had a reprieve this week. I only had one funeral this week, but for two and a half weeks, I had one to three funerals a day. Wow. Yeah. And all COVID, all COVID related. And, and mostly older people? You know, no children, thank God, and no like 20 or 30 year olds, but healthy people. Some of them who are 90 years old living in a nursing home and some of them who are 70 years old living at home and still working full time. Um, 60 years old too, 63 year old. So some were healthy, some were young, some were not so young, a little mix of everything. I see. So maybe tell us a little bit about your, your community. You're in Northern New Jersey, not far from New York City. Tell us the route. The synagogue itself is in Cluster, but you're drawing from a little bit larger area than, than Cluster. Correct. So we're in um, Cluster, which is it's pronounced yeah. Cluster. Thank it's okay, you. everyone Cluster. gets it wrong. And um, we're very close to Manhattan. In fact, in training for the ride for the living, it would be a regular thing that I would do, uh, whether I would be doing the ride or not, to ride my bicycle from my house to Manhattan. That's how close it is. It's not very far. Um, with no traffic now, I can get over the bridge and be in Manhattan in 13 minutes with no traffic. With traffic, it could take an hour, but it, it's pretty close. Um, our synagogue's a conservative synagogue right down the middle, so not reform, not orthodox. We have about 800 families, that's 800 households that are members of our synagogue. At least we do today. I don't know what it's going to look like as a result. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like as a result of COVID. However, we are determined in our synagogue, no one is going to be allowed to leave 
meaning if they say they want out because they can't afford it or it's not a part, we're not, we're, we're just not doing that to anybody. We're not having anyone leave under these circumstances. And um, yeah, we have a large uh, office too. We have a, a cantor. We have two other rabbis, one who does just youth education, one who's an assistant to me and a big office staff. And um, normally we've been doing a lot of activities, you know, in what would be normal operating procedures. We've been doing even more since we've gone into coronavirus mode. And how did you, you you're originally from, uh, from Detroit suburbs? I grew up in Detroit, went to college in Toronto. Actually did a year of college in Israel and then college in Toronto. Went to JTS for rabbinical school, which is in Manhattan and stayed there ever since, you know, in the tri-state area. I started working for JTS soon after I was ordained. I worked there for eight years and then I took this job. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, you're, you, you're such a fan of Poland and, and of what we're doing. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But what, what about your first visit to Poland? Was it with, was it with the synagogue? No. You've been before. My my first visit to Poland was in 1996, and I was nine years old. And um, so it was in 1996, and I was staffing a trip for United Synagogue Youth, USY pilgrimage, a Poland pilgrimage. And it was quite transformational for me. In college, I had studied a lot about the Shoah and the Holocaust. And USY does a really excellent job of education for um, in history. So we're one of the few uh, troops groups that really went everywhere. We went to um, Sobibor, which most didn't do. We spent a lot of time in Lublin and Łódź. Um, obviously, Krakow and Warsaw also. They spent nine days um, in Poland. And I was very captured by that trip. And then I led that trip four more times. Wow. And then um, I took my in-laws on a trip. And then I was asked to lead a trip to Poland for two other organizations and then started bringing synagogue trips as well. So I've been to Poland, I think 16, 15, 16 times um, in total. And, um, you know, sometimes we're just going to, to Krakow, sometimes it's Krakow and Warsaw. Sometimes it's, you know, all the places and all the history that's there. So I've really all had an affinity uh, to Poland. That's how I learned to say Woda Niega Zavana Shedem Jeshem Prussia, because we used to buy 60 non-carbonated waters for the kids on the trip, you know. And um, a few other words I would learn here or there, some that aren't worthy of being repeated now. Um, and I've really seen just an evolution of the country uh, in that time, an evolution of their response to World War II, an evolution of their response to the Jewish community, an evolution of their own growth, maturity, identity of their own country and not living in a shadow anymore. And it's been really um, quite beautiful to watch and to witness. And I've fallen in love with a lot of the Polish people. They're just fantastic human beings. Um, and I feel very close to all of them. Wow, so 15, I hadn't realized, I knew you're a, you know, an old Polish hand, but I didn't, I didn't realize 15, 16 times is very impressive. Yeah, what most don't know is that I say I wanna lead people on a trip. I want them to understand history. I have a deep insatiable yearning for pierogies. And um, it's hard to tell looking at me. I know when I stand up, everyone could tell. But I love pierogies. I can eat them all day long. And one of the most important things I do when I come to Poland is making sure that I go to all the right places to eat. So one of my favorite places in Warsaw is actually a small chain called Zapiecik. Um, and they have the most amazing pierogies and latkes and borscht. And when I have a trip going to Poland, I start craving it about two months in advance. So, um, and map out my food there. So one of the reasons I like to go so often is just to get my, you know, recommended daily allowance of pierogies. And what are your, fav what are your favorite kind of pierogies? I love the mushroom, spinach, sauteed and onion, all the stuff that's bad for you, a little bit of sour cream with it. I never in my wildest dreams would drink borscht, never. I drink it in Poland every day. I love it hot, it's delicious. Um, the latkes there are second to none. So yeah. I'm, I'm a major foodie. In case you didn't know this, Jonathan, big foodie. I wrote, I spent my, my sabbatical last summer writing a food blog and getting it published um, online. It's called The Two Plate Solution for Food in Israel. So I really know my food and people always come to me with orders. What should we get? What should we do? Where should we eat? And I haven't disappointed on that front. I'm there. I have a lot of confidence. Everything else in my life, not so much. Uh -huh. No messing around. And a question, a very relevant question coming in from our own Agnes Gigish. Are you, uh, you know, every year we do hear the Latka Hamantaschen debate during the festival. And uh, important question we really should ask every guest, are you team Latka or team Hamantaschen? Yes. 
Good answer. Very rabbinic. Very, yes. very Solomonic. Yes. Very Solomonic. So, you know, we have just such a, such a wonderful relationship with your synagogue, our JCC, and me personally. You know, there are a few synagogues in the world, Park Avenue in New York City, B'nai Yashurin in, in Cleveland, and, and, and you guys uh, that we just have this really just kind of special bond with been here and I've been there to speak and back and forth and 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 maybe maybe because it's not only obviously such such an important part of that is you but it's beyond that it's your community so your community has really taken to Poland and and this vision of Poland and 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 the change that you've seen can you talk about that a little yeah um, I'm going to be rabbinic for a moment we pray three okay. times a day the words mechayehametim that bring the dead back to life and whenever I'm at the JCC, that's what I feel. And I think it has two meanings. You know, the, the, the sermonic meaning, the kind of simple meaning is that there are 6 million Jewish people who died, a majority of them in Poland during the war, and that we're bringing their memory back to life by coming back there and bringing life back, yes. But when I see people who are young, who are in their 20s and 30s and have literally dusted off from the attic their history and realize the connective tissue they have to Judaism and to their history and have embraced it and taken a bite off of it and are thirsty and are curious. And I see how engaged they are with that sense of history and how now there's a portal for them that will feed and, and quench that thirst. That's holy for me. And that really is about revitalizing Jewish life in Poland. It's not necessarily about, you know, people with strimals going back to the Ramah synagogue and bringing it back to life. It's about people who are, who are uncovering their identity and thirsty and learning, not only for a self-identity, but for a connection for their self to a greater community. So to me, that's holy and sacred work. That's no different than someone who walks into my synagogue in New Jersey or a synagogue in Cleveland or a synagogue in Manhattan and says, I'm curious. Something happened in my life that has made me curious and I want to learn. I want to grow. And you know, that's what rabbis and synagogues and cantors are in business for. And the JCC is just a fertile ground for that growth. So for me, it's a sense of holiness that we wanna to continue to enable. And I hope it's happening in places beyond Krakow. I know Krakow is the um, Tiffany standard for how it's working, but I've seen it happen in Budapest. I've seen it happen in Prague. Uh, I think it's happening in Berlin and Vienna and a few other places as well in a different way, in a different flavor as it should. But to see Jewish life coming back in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, especially through this sense of curiosity in a very organic way, is, uh, is holy for me. Amen. Amen. And not only, you know, not only do we have a special relationship, but your, your community has been so supportive of our center. Uh, we've been delivering food packages and medicine to our Holocaust survivors in a van that was purchased for us uh, through funds that came directly from your community. So on behalf of all of our survivors in the community, I want to, you know, thank you and thank, you know, we've of course thanked you before, but to thank you again in this forum for, 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 for making that possible. You know, I think that we bought the van and it was like maybe two weeks later or not long, within the month was the whole Corona situation. And we didn't understand that we'd be needing it for such an important purpose so quickly. So thank you for that. Thank you. You know, you're the ones using it for the holy work. And um, as I told people, it's not only for survivors, because sadly, the, the age of the survivor generation is dwindling. It's also for righteous Gentiles. And it's also for young people who are, um, who are uncovering and unpacking and dusting off this identity and giving them a tether to the community and showing them that Judaism isn't just something that we are. It's something we do. And part of doing in Judaism is how we engage, how we help, how we support. You know, so people say, what does it mean to be Jewish? Or how do you daven? And, and I tell people, you know, the best way to daven is with your hands, not with your words. Because with your hands, if you're davening, you're, you're making something happen. And um, I tell this to people, there's a guy who came to me a few years ago and said, Rabbi, I have one day off a week from work and it's Saturday. And what I try and do is I go to a soup kitchen with my son and then we go do something fun together. Like we go bowling or we play golf or whatever it is. I said, you know, it's funny. I go to synagogue every week and I think you're more holy than I am. Meaning that's what Judaism is. That's what it is to be Jewish. And if giving you four wheels to enable you to be Jewish for that population helps, we should be thanking you. Wow. I think uh, I think I might I might only have rabbis on as guests. Uh, this is uh, 
as somebody, as somebody who's not a professional interviewer by or broadcaster or anything, I have to tell you, Rabbi, it's a pleasure. Uh, so you were you you mentioned ride for the living. You were planning on coming this year and doing our bicycle ride. Uh, that's not going to happen this year for obvious reasons that you won't be able to join us. Uh, hopefully, you'll be with us 2021. But you are going to do the virtual ride for the living that we're migrating. Uh, most of the ride will be online, and hopefully, participants all over the world will be joining. It's much easier to join than than coming over to Poland. Maybe tell us why was it important for you to come? You know, you've known about the ride for a while. Uh, why was it important for you to come and do do the bicycle ride? So um, there are a few reasons. One, I used to be an avid cyclist, so I was riding um, a few years ago, 100 miles a week, and just by pure luck, like the first day that this uh, pandemic hit and we thought we'd be locked in our house for a week or two, I reached out to this company called Peloton, which has this you know, in-house bike thing. And um, I ordered a bike and they said, okay, we'll be here in 11 weeks. I said, 11 weeks, you know, I'm going to be on my way to Israel and Poland. They're like, who cares? And I said, I'll, I'll can't, I was going to cancel the order. I couldn't get online to cancel the order. <laughs> so that was on a Mon on a Tuesday. On Thursday, I get an email saying, we'll deliver your bike tomorrow. So I said, okay, because you get 30 days to return it with no questions asked. And I said, I'll try it. I'm probably not going to use it or hold clothing. I got it, started riding, and I got back in the groove. And I've been riding every day. I've been doing a minimum of 10, sometimes 20 or 30 miles a day. And I charted a path from my house to the Santa Monica Pier. So right now, I'm about to get to Detroit, which is where I grew up. So I'm making my way. So that's number one. Number one is I think it's good to be in shape and healthy, and I've been riding, so I've been thinking about this ride. Number two is this trip was bigger than just coming for the ride for the living. I was bringing my kids for the first time to Poland. My wife's been, but my kids haven't. And we were spending a week in Poland. We were planning on spending uh, three and a half days in Warsaw, four days in Krakow, including Shabbat, and then we were headed to Israel for the summer. And my daughter and my son both go to Jewish day school, but I wanted them to see Poland through my eyes for the first time, or with me, I should say, for the first time. Um, they've been to Europe, a lot of Europe. Um, my daughter just went to Vienna. We've been to Prague together. We've been many other places as well. Uh, but this was important for me. The ride, I think, was just about fortifying our connection between our synagogue and our community and the JCC in Krakow, and really highlighting the notion of life, that we were going the opposite direction. We weren't going to Auschwitz. We were leaving Auschwitz. We were going from Auschwitz to Krakow, and we were showing what life looks like now. This is what it is to be reborn. So for me, that was very symbolic, but I was really also um, very much looking forward to I can't say looking forward, but looking forward to the meaningfulness of being in Poland with my kids and giving them that part of their Jewish identity, which isn't only about death. It's really much more about life. There's a small portion, six terrible years of death, but there's 500 years of life there. And I wanted them to see Jewish life for Ashkenazic Jews. I wanted them to see where so much of their tradition and history comes from. I wanted them to understand that Camp Ramah came from the Ramah Synagogue. I'm just kidding. I know it didn't. Um, but I wanted them to see you know, good, this though. sense. <laughs> I wanted them to see this sense of history that is there. And that's very important. And um, that to me is a sad moment. But it's a moment that I know got deferred with the help of God. We're healthy. So please, God, we're going to be there. And um, we'll, we'll make it happen, you know, but yeah. just not this summer. Amen. So you mentioned your children. This is a big, uh, this is a very important time for you with your son's bar mitzvah. Can you talk a little bit about that and the project? Because it's a phenomenal project. It's really, really exciting. We're, I'm going to get involved. Our JCC wants to get involved as well and help spread the word and, and support that. So talk, talk about that because I think it's just great. Thank you. So I got to tell you, my son wakes up every morning, goes to bed every night, wants to know how much we got. And this is a kid who, you know, he hasn't gotten any presents for his bar mitzvah. He got one picture from my brother of Patrick Mahomes, the quarterback, signed. That was one of the things he had wanted, which is fine. But, you know, most kids are getting presents and computers and bikes and games. He doesn't want any of it. He just wants to help the hungry. Now, since he's been little, we, we spend our summers in Israel very often. My son's been to Israel 14 or 15 times, my daughter 16 times. Um, and every time we go, we, we pack food for the needy at Pantry Packers. It's a very important place, and it's a mitzvah where we're feeding the hungry, but they don't know who's giving it to them, and we don't know who it's going to, which is, according to my mind, it's the highest form of, of tzedakah. So he decided for his bar mitzvah, this is what he wanted to do. And because we can't actually have people you know, packing in Israel, he wanted to raise funds. 
Now, what we had planned for his bar mitzvah is in New Jersey for the Center for Food Action, we were gonna have a very large kiddish lunch, but in order to get into the lunch, everyone had to pack 10 snack packs for kids that were hungry. Today, we can't do that because of Corona. So he has raised funds and so far, he has raised $33,000 with two weeks left to go before his bar mitzvah. And he's really hoping to hit the $36,000 mark beforehand. So I think that's gonna happen. And, you know, he's just an amazing boy. I'm a little biased, but he's a really good kid. And he's just really passionate about helping feed the hungry and working. Um, look, I will tell you between us on this call, I'm a little disappointed because I had looked forward to this bar mitzvah as much as he did, having all of our friends and family come in, celebrating with our synagogue family. He was three weeks old when we moved to New Jersey. They've watched them, him grow up before their eyes. And I was really looking forward to that moment of celebrating with everybody. But once I get past that sadness, I realize, thank God he is well, he is healthy, he is, he's a good person. He has really focused and set his coordinates on how to make a difference in the world. And in doing so, um, he's, he's going to have a bar mitzvah where he can have even more people log in, sign in by Zoom and be with us virtually. And I think that's going to be great and very meaningful for him. And when the time is right, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate with family. We're going to celebrate with his friends. When it's all healthy and safe, we will do that. So the things that matter the most are what matters the most. And that's his health and our nuclear family being together. So we're really looking forward to that in two weeks. I'm going to send you a link and I'm going to send it for you to send to everyone who's part of the JCC and Krakow family. The more people that join, the better it is. It is a great celebration. We could hold up to 10,000 people virtually. Um, on this link, and he would love to have all those people celebrating with us that day. He has a very funny speech. We've been working on it, so it's worth it alone just to listen to his speech. Absolutely, we'd love to, we'd love to support you, and you've been so supportive of us. And you know, it's such a such a good cause. And uh, I have to tell you, you know, when I was when I was still, and I think you know, we're close in age. We were in an age where we were we were still in selfish mode uh, as kids uh, back back then. Uh, nobody. Nobody I knew did, uh, you know, just didn't didn't want the presents. But we probably, I don't know, kids today probably also have a little bit more than uh, than many of us had uh, back back in the day. But I just think that it's not only the material aspect. I just think there's an awareness of need in the world that we weren't. It wasn't 13 year olds, 12 year olds back in the day. We weren't talking about world hunger and what we could do about it in in any sense. It's just a different different generation, huh? You know, knowing that his bar mitzvah, a has saved us a lot of money because we're not having the celebrations we were planning on. And B, isn't exactly what we had planned on. I said to him, Elias, if you could have one present for your bar mitzvah, like you get one thing special that would come, like what would it be? Thinking maybe he'd say a special computer, but he has, or a bike or this or that. And he said, nothing, I have everything I want. I said, well, what a one thing? He goes, I'd like to go on a fishing trip with you. Or maybe we go to the Super Bowl. Well, we don't know if there's gonna be a Super Bowl. Number one. Number two, fishing trip. You don't have to twist my arm very hard because we go fishing a lot together, but we can't travel right now. But he just doesn't want. And for me, the idea that we have such a large synagogue family and that he wants to engage them in helping and all he cares about is he's competitive. Don't get me wrong. He, I think he gets that from his mom. Um, he, he's competitive. So he wants to keep reaching higher and setting new goals. He's about, he's $400 away from overtaking the highest amount ever raised for pantry packers. Um, so, so he keeps looking at that, but that's all he wants. He wants to know, and he keeps saying, how many people are we feeding by doing this? How long will it last them? That's where his orientation is, and I just couldn't be prouder of him. I said to him, being a bar mitzvah isn't about a date. It's not about tefillin. It's about values, and you got it. You're a, you're a bar mitzvah already. Whatever, whatever, however, whatever you're doing, you're doing the right thing. You should have a lot of nachas. That's just wonderful. It's his Wonderful. Thank you. It's his mother. You should know. You've met her. It's his I mother. Have, I know that she's doing some wonderful, exciting things as well. So yeah. overall, 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 Rabbi, just tell me at this, you know, you, you have such an amazing community and, and you guys really a tight community that is uh, uh, doing so much good in the world and stuff. What for you, what, what would you say we've all migrated to, to, to kind of living online and, and, and engaging with people by telephone and online. What have really been the challenges for you, both for a community? I understand, you know, that with all the funerals that it's been just the challenges of people, people passing away. And then, but at, at overall for the community and for yourself, what would you say the largest challenges have been during the time of Corona? And what are you worried about as we come out of this? These are good questions. Um, 
So the challenges have been a fewfold. One is it's very, you realize what social beasts we are and we realize how important the notion of touch, actual physical touch is. When I see people who I, I love and I care for who've been part of my family for the last 15 years and they're in pain because their loved one died and I can't hug them, that hurts my soul. It's, it's as if we are emotionally handcuffed and that has been really challenging. I have been a person who has gone to the funeral, um, but we have had cases where people, I had one guy who lost his uncle, his father, and his mother-in-law in four days, wow. all from COVID. And um, they're only allowed three mourners at the graveside. So we, we are able to use technology and have a hundred people there, right? but only three actual people. So that's been really hard also. And you realize that people really need touch. They need to be by you. There are people I care about who are in a bed, in a hospital or at home, and you can't see them. You can't stand by their bedside, but you're craving to and you want to. So we realize how valuable like physical appropriate touch is and how handcuffed we feel emotionally right now. That's a very hard thing for us. Um, you know, we have people who are older, you know, my mother, for example, very independent, lives by herself. She's 83 years young in Florida, she's all by herself. So my brothers and I had to do an intervention to keep her at home for quite a while because she wanted to go out and about. And she's at home, she has limited technology skills and she doesn't have anyone to share this with. My father died almost 10 years ago. And that's very, very hard. So that's been really challenging as well. And all of my instincts say, bring her up to me, right? I could get a jet, I could put her on a plane, do we, I could drive down there and get her, but it's not even safe for her to be up here right, in the epicenter of where all of this, um, you know, is transmitting and that I do go out once in a while, like that, that's just not safe or good. So this has been a challenge and that's been really, really hard. Um, that said, let me tell you where I'm really proud of our community and a lot of other communities. From the day this happened, we pivoted from having daily services in the synagogue to having daily services online. We didn't miss one day. So not one person who had a yard site, not one person who had a simcha, anything going on that they weren't being afforded with the synagogue offers. The only thing we did do is for bar mitzvahs and weddings, we gave them the opportunity to postpone. And some postponed and some are going on. Like my family, we're going on with the bar mitzvah, limited attendance of just the immediate family, whereas others postponed their date and that's their prerogative. Um, our synagogue used to send out a message once a week. We send out one every day, always of hope and inspiration, every day. We have a tree of not only the clergy, but a lot of our leadership who are calling people in our synagogue every single week to check on their whereabouts, especially people over a certain age. Do you need medicine? Do you need groceries? I have an army of people who are shopping on behalf of those others. Some who say, I have a regular um, order of food coming every week. I can add to it. Tell me who needs what and I'll get it brought to us and we'll get it to them. So people have really shown their reflex of goodness, of kindness, of mitzvot, and that's been beautiful. I think that, um, I, I hate to say this and this is not what I wanted to get us there, but this was a moment that has defibrillated. I don't know how you say that in Polish, but has defibrillated um, our entire world and we needed it because we were really living in a world that had no rhythm to our shared heartbeat. It was divisive. It was, are you Republican? Are you Democrat? Are you right-leaning? Are you left-leaning? Are you Zionist? Are you anti-Zionist, pro-BB, anti-BB, all of these kinds of things. And that was what defined us. And today what we are defined by is DNA. Are you a human being? If you're a human being and you are suffering and I'm not, I want to help you. That has been what's defined us and brought us back to center. So the challenge in getting back to some sense of normal is going to be maintaining that. You know, after 9-11, all of us looked each other in the eye, all of us gave hugs, we were compassionate, and then in time, it wears off. We don't want this to wear off. We want this goodness, this humanity, this kindness to keep going. But we don't want there to be a pandemic that keeps going also. So I think that's gonna be one of our biggest challenges. For people who used to curse technology before this, we should be praising technology. I say a, a little prayer every day for, um, oh, his name has forgotten me from Microsoft, uh, escaped me from Microsoft um, and Steve Jobs from Bill Apple, Gates. But Bill, Gates. Bill Gates, thank you. Um, you know, for what they have invented and enabled us to do, look what I'm doing right now, you know, 
that's a blessing. Minions are a blessing. You know, Zooming, talking, FaceTime, all a blessing. Um, and getting perspective, I think, is really important for us. And the need for community, for people who were very individualized before, staying part of a community has never been so valuable as it is. In addition, the other thing our synagogue's done, there hasn't been one night where we haven't done programming. So every single night we offer some level of programming from the temple. You were our speaker one night. We have different speakers who come in. Sorry, my daughter's phone. We have different speakers who come in, different programs. Next week we're doing a program called What's Cooking at Temple Emmanuel, where you have different people cooking a different dish each night and teaching how to do that. We've had a comedy night. We've had Torah study. You name it, because people are home and they're thirsty and they want to be part of community. They want to check in. We have our regular study groups that are happening also. So that's all been a blessing for some sense of normalcy. Very long-winded answer. I'm sorry. That was it. No, that was a fantastic. It was a complicated, multi-part question. That was a great answer. I wonder really if, if it, it, it almost as difficult in some in some sense of switching from normal world to Corona world will be from switching from Corona back back to normal without losing all the positive things that we've maybe learned about ourselves as human beings? You know, I think that's our challenge always, right? I remember long ago, I was working, you know, crazy hours and not hyper-connected and um, it was hard. And my wife and I went on a vacation for three and a half weeks to Australia. You know, it took a week and a half just to get there. And um, I came back and I remember like, you know, just being a different kind of employee and coworker. And I remember saying to myself, how do I keep this momentum? How do I make this last so it doesn't just go? And I think that's always one of our challenges. Yeah. Um, I want to do that. I've been having meals with my kids seven days a week, two meals a day. I want to maintain some level of normalcy in doing that. Um, that's a hard thing to do when you're running a synagogue and the busiest times are from three in the afternoon till 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night. But finding these times where you can have these sacrosanct moments, times to work out, times for self-care, you know, that's going to be our biggest challenge. But let me put it this way. I think you'll appreciate. We're looking forward to that challenge. That's a challenge we're ready to embrace. Amen. Well, I look forward to riding alongside you, to staying in touch. Uh, to, I want to thank you for this. But before you go, I am instituting a new, a new feature of my AMA, uh, which is the last question that I'll ask everybody. You're the first one. You're the guinea pig. Uh oh I used to always want to ask this during uh, during job interviews, but my team told me that I'm not allowed. They, I'm generally all over the place, and they kind of rein me in. I, I always wanted to ask everybody what their three favorite movies are. Oh, that's easy. There you go. Um, and it's hard to prioritize, but very easy for me. The Godfather, The Frisco Kid, and Sixteen Candles. And you can ask that question for a job interview. Of course you can. Yeah, got to be sometimes, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. No, I'm, so I'm with you. I have to tell you, that's a good three. That's, yeah. a, that's a good three. And I wanted to make, I always wanted to make a website. If you took, asked everybody their three favorite movies and then saw what the highest ranked movies are based on the three favorite. I think, I don't think Frisco Kid would make the mark in the top hundred. Well, maybe I think 16, rabbis. From rabbis. Rabbis, it, it might. 16 Candles will for our generation, but The Godfather across John, the board. Yeah, The Godfather for, yeah, anybody, right. I think for, for, especially for guys, probably in between 30 and 70, Godfather is, is going to be pretty high up there. But yeah. 16, when my daughter, John when Hughes, my, that's right. When my daughter became a bat mitzvah, one of her rites of passage was watching Godfather 1 and 2 with me. I have, a, I have it in chronological order, which is an interesting way to see it. And it's coming up for my son soon, too. Yeah, that's part of being an adult. The saga, when they released it, they cut it, edited it, so that would be the saga. Yeah. I'm, I'm completely obsessed as well. So we have to, um, when we ride next to each other uh, on, those, on those long miles between Auschwitz and Krakow, we'll talk Godfather. Okay, well, I'll tell you, in closing, my daughter had a great line when she watched it. When Sonny was gunned down at the toll booth, she goes, I wish, I wish he had Easy Pass. <laughs> the, Jones Beach, the Jones Beach Causeway. Yeah, Fair exactly. Oh, Rabbi, great. thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And may you go from strength to strength and continue serving your community and being a light onto the Jewish world. And it's been inspiring for me talking to you. It, it's been an honor for me. I want to thank you and Sebastian, your, your amazing team. And may God keep you safe and all of us safe. I really look forward very much to seeing you in person. Thank you. Be well, Rabbi. You too. Thank you. So we are. Still, that was uh, Rabbi David Seth Kirshner, fantastic guest. I think uh, we might have to have rabbis have two. We've had two amazing rabbis so far, Rabbi Avi Baumel and Rabbi David Seth Kirshner. 
looks like rabbis, rabbis are the way to go. Next week, I'm not gonna really reveal the guest, but it's not a rabbi. I wanted to uh, see, there were just some questions that I didn't exactly get to before. One was from great friend of the JCC, Haley Warner. Haley was asking, let me scroll back and get it. Haley was asking, is the preschool opening for the summer and when is the end of school? The preschool is generally open in July, but not August. We take August off and uh, this year we'll see. Hopefully we're gonna reopen uh, at some point in May would be my guess. Decent chance that we open in the next couple of weeks and then uh, have it open through July. I think no matter when we open, we wouldn't be open in uh, August. Generally the school year here in Poland is uh, October through, uh, for universities are October through the end of June and schools are September through the end of June, I guess like the US. So July and August are off. But for preschools, I think only August is the month that they are generally closed. Um, if you guys have any more questions, I have a couple more minutes. I also wanted to show you guys something. I'm very proud of a certain purchase I made. One second. As a big Star Wars fan, I had to go and get the Darth Vader COVID mask. Um, very available available uh, online, certainly in Poland. Um, I, with the, you know, I don't want to say that I don't mind uh, the whole Corona situation, but I got to tell you, having a snazzy Darth Vader mask makes it uh, makes it much easier. Also, what do you guys think of the three favorite movie questions? I always want to ask everybody the three favorite movie questions, uh, but I get this. My my staff doesn't let me. But now I've been told by the rabbi that it's an acceptable question on a job on an interview when we're hiring staff. Hi, Sita. Sita, how are you? Great to see you. Maybe my dad is also watching. Sita takes care of my dad. It is in there in New York. So it could be my dad's watching. Uh, people, oh, I see people like my, uh, my Darth Vader mask. Jeffrey Rolat says I'm not well. I'm very well, Jeffrey. I hope you're feeling better. We after your shot in your uh, epidural yesterday for your back. Hope you're doing better, Jeff, with back problems. But I think it's a good question, the three favorite movies. Uh, so I'm going to have to say my three favorite movies, and you guys can uh, chime in if you like. Definitely Godfather, Pulp Fiction, and Heathers. I think Godfather, Pulp Fiction, and Heathers, if I have to go with three, although top 10 is easier, but three, it's fun because it's a tough question. Hello, Ben Myers in Israel. I just did, Vicky. Let's see your favorite three movies. God, um, yep, Godfather, Pulp Fiction, and Heathers. I'm going to stick with those three. So with that, I am going to thank everybody for tuning in. We ran a little bit long, but the rabbi had uh, plenty to say. It was, I thought, really just a wonderful, wonderful guest. I'm excited for next week. And as I said, I think that although at a certain point, the corona, this corona thing will end, uh, let's hope, sooner rather than later, I'm going to continue doing the AMA because there's lots of interesting people for me to talk to and I get an excuse to call them and uh, share a lot of my friends with, uh, with the rest of you guys. So thank you very much. Stay safe, be well, and I will see you all next week at 10 o'clock New York time, 4 p.m. Krakow time, 7 a.m. Jeffrey Rola time, 5 p.m. Israel time. Take care.